All right. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us uh, for today's Google Hangout. The title of today's Google Hangout is Inside Look, Conserving the Circle of Bronzino's Madonna and Child with Infant St. John, um, a work of art that's in the Portland Art Museum's collection. My name is Mike Morawski, Director of Education and Public Programs here at the Portland Art Museum, and I am super thrilled to be doing our first ever Google Hangout program um, and couldn't have thought a better topic or better people to join uh, for this conversation. Today's Hangout is going to focus on exploring the recent conservation treatment of the painting that I just mentioned, uh, which is in the Portland Art Museum's European collection and was a gift of the Samuel Kress Foundation. Today we're joined by Dawson Carr, who is the Janet and Richard Geary Curator of European Art at the Portland Art Museum, as well as Nika Gutman Rieppe, who is Associate Conservator at the Crest Program in Painting Conservation at NYU's Institute of Fine Arts Conservation Center. So thank you, Dawson and Nika, for joining us today. Dawson and Nika are going to provide a behind-the-scenes look at the process of restoration of the painting and discuss what we've learned about the painting's treatment before it returns to Portland later this summer to go back on view, which we're extremely excited about. Uh, quickly, as we get started, I thought I would mention a couple housekeeping things in the Google Hangout. Um, and I hope that people have been able to connect with us um, on this Hangout, um, either via the Google application or on YouTube, which we're live streaming to. Um, you can use the Q&A function, which we have open for viewers to use. If you want to use the Q&A function and you're viewing this in the Hangout, if you go to the left side of the screen, click on the Q&A icon. You can actually type in questions live during the conversation. I've got it up, and I've got uh, taking a look at it. We've got a couple questions already in, so that's fantastic. If you are watching this via YouTube or you are not familiar with the Hangout technology, or if you're even watching this in archive later after this afternoon or this evening, um, we'd love for you to, to submit your questions via Twitter. All you have to do is use the hashtag Portland Art Museum, hashtag Portland Art Museum. And we'll keep a lot look at that during this conversation. I can pull any questions from that. Um, but we also love to answer any questions you have after today's conversation. So with those nuts and bolts out of the way, I would love to turn it over to uh, Dawson Carr, our curator of European art here at the Portland Art Museum, to get us started talking about the painting that we're going to be focusing on today. Dawson? Thanks, Mike. I wonder, could you get up the first slide, uh, the photograph of the painting before treatment? Yeah. There we go. Let me, OK, people should be able to view it now. When I took up my post here in Portland in January of 2013, um, this was the painting that most stood out uh, to me as needing restoration as looking unloved and uh, uh, in need of treatment. And part of it you can see very well in this slide. And that's the discolored varnish. Varnish uh, tends to go yellowish uh, in time. And in this case, there is a yellow cast uh, over the entire image. What this image is not showing that was very evident in the gallery is that the varnish was not only discolored but becoming cloudy and therefore graying out a bit and more than anything obscuring form. If you cast your eye to the area in the lower left corner, or I'm sorry, the lower right corner of the painting, uh, the Madonna's lap, and the legs of the Christ child, and particularly that back leg of the Christ child, you'll see that space had been really, really disturbed in this image. Of course, uh, this kind of devotional image depends upon the figures being pushed way up toward the picture plane, and with a dark background, to encourage uh, a sense of intimacy between the viewer and, uh, and the uh, figures in the painting. And if you look at that back leg of the Christ child, you can see that it's really not sitting in space. The space that is in this painting is virtually just a little bit beyond the depth of the Madonna's uh, lap, but there's still space there. But when I encountered it, this was a very flat image. The modeling, as well, 
was very blotchy, mottled, um, and being broken up. The strength of the forms was simply flat and not evident, something very atypical of Bronzino and his followers. Before turning over to Nika, I should also say and address the attribution issue here. I don't know of anyone who could sustain an attribution to Bronzino himself of this painting today. In fact, when Samuel Crest bought the painting uh, from Count Alessandro Contini Bonacossi in the early 1950s, he was told by uh, Bernard Berenson, uh, one, of, one of the many people advising him, um, that although Berenson had included it among, listed it among autograph works by Bronzino, um, that he did not really believe that. He really did not believe that it was by Bronzino's hand. And I think mm, pretty much all scholars would agree with that today. Um, it has more than anything to do with the refinement of drawing. It's just not quite at the level uh, of Bronzino. And the forms, particularly the heads of the two children, are not at all typical of Bronzino. Uh, the head of the Christ child has been noted before. Many people uh, uh, like to relate to portraits of Medici babies. And indeed, it may vaguely reflect uh, images of, uh, of young Medici males. Um, now, this could be a product that came out of Bronzino's workshop. Uh, in other words, it's kind of like a brand today. Uh, today. Um, then again, Bronzino had many followers who never worked for him, and it might equally be uh, one of those followers as well. Um, the transformation um, has suggested some new names, and, and we'll get into that. But at this point, having talked a bit about why we wanted uh, to have the painting restored, um, I should mention one other thing, and that is that, of course, we hope to learn about the painting, how it was constructed, was it constructed in the way that Bronzino and his shop uh, uh, operate? And so we contacted the Crest Foundation. Uh, the Crest Foundation is very good to, uh, to the recipients of, uh, of Samuel H. Crest's great bequest of paintings all around the country and asked for this to be restored. And we shipped it off, uh, off to Nika in New York. And Nika, I wonder if you'd tell us a little about um, what you found. Sure, Dawson. Um, so when the painting came to the Conservation Center, um, I think the first thing that we start doing when a painting comes in is it's amazing the amount of information that you can get just when you're examining a painting with visual, visual light and looking with your eyes. And we study then the painting under a stereo microscope. And um, I hope, then we look at the painting under in different areas of the way across the spectrum of the electromagnetic radiation. And so we looked with ultraviolet light, we x-rayed the painting, and we looked with infrared reflectography. And it gave us a host of information of why the painting looked the way it did when it came in, and as well as a lot of information about the materials and techniques um, and how the painting evolved into the image. And I thought, though, that I would start the first thing that we did um, was I wanted us to look, if we could go to slide number two, and um, this shows the painting on the left. It um, shows the painting before treatment, and it's a detail. And on the right, we can see um, of the figure of St. John. And infrared light is really telling, it can tell us a lot of information about the varnish layers, as well as um, about restorations on the painting, such as retouching. And um, one thing that I wanted to point out, um, when Dawson was talking about how there was this sort of murky appearance to the varnish layer, and there was also a chalkiness and lightness to the figures, and um, we wanted to figure out exactly what was causing that. So under infrared um, light, we can see a lot of information, and you can see on the right these areas, dark patchy areas that you see um, on the face and torso, and those are areas of non-original, what you're seeing is non-original paint retouching um, that's on the surface. And 
you know, our first thought was, what is this retouching covering? Is it covering damage? Um, we knew that the figures themselves had a very light and chalky appearance, um, and so that was something that was going to be uncovered during the cleaning. And um, there were at least three layers of a synthetic varnish layer that were so thick that um, they were rendering the dark background. They were difficult to see through, um, so the dark background didn't have the depth and saturation, and as well as the colors weren't weren't brightly saturated. Um, so, when um, and actually, if you want to, we can go to slide number three just to show you the extent of this retouching. If you look at both figures, all of that dark patchy area is non-original paint. It's retouching applied by a restorer, and um, there was an extensive amount, as you can see. Um, and that these are just in the details, but this was also on the Madonna. Um, and so, and, and then I guess if we go to number four, um, so what you're seeing on the left is, um, so the retouching was able, I was able to remove the retouching and remove that thick layer of varnish, and already just doing that, it was amazing the improvement, the sense of surface that was achieved. Um, and then, unfortunately, you know, we wondered what was underneath all of this retouching, and on the left you can see that um, what happened is that the paint surface was very blanched, and blanching is sort of it, that was the light, the light and chalky appearance of the paint surface. And blanching could be caused by a lot of factors, but it is um, it's an alteration of the paint surface. And you can see those areas. We have um, the flatness, loss of tonality of the pigments, um, and it has this mottled appearance that Dawson was talking about. Um, and so it really became a challenge about. I'd say 80% of the figures were blanched, and um, it can be very difficult to treat blanching. Um, so I did a tremendous amount of testing and studying of the paint surface. I took paint samples, um, trying to figure out exactly what was going on with the paint layer. And we were very successful in treating it. If you look, the slide image on the right shows the figure. Um, I was able to reform the paint. Um, Dawson, do you want me to talk about reforming of the paint? Absolutely, please. Uh, okay. This will be something, first off, we should tell people that uh, in the process of this, um, uh, I was in contact with colleagues of the National Gallery in London um, who explained to me that this is a very, very common problem, this blanching, with the works of Bronzino and his followers. Um, a, more often than not, uh, in fact, that, well, Nika, I mean, this has to do, perhaps, we don't know, but perhaps with Bronzino and his followers' own technique, yes. but as well, there's the possibility that the blanching has occurred because of subsequent restoration treatment of the works. Yeah, and when we examine, I think it's a combination of that, and examination of the paint surface did suggest that some of this was related to a past a past cleaning of the painting that had altered altered the paint surface. Um, but it was an amazing transformation. Um, typically, you know, blanching can be we try to to deal with blanching. You know, there are various techniques out there. Um, it sometimes it's not successful in reforming paint layers. And I attempted, I went through the literature, I tested with every technique that was out there, and unfortunately I was not able to find a solution. And then I made an alteration of a technique that was done by a uh, conservator, John Brealey, and it, was, it worked perfectly. Um, the painting itself, I varnished the painting, and then I built up a chamber, small localized chambers, working down different, you know, kept working across the paint layer, and created solvent chambers where, um, so the painting was not directly exposed to solvent, but um, fumes of the solvent were suspended on top of the paint painting. It was laid down flat on a surface. And then um, I created these little micro chambers and worked area by area. And these chambers sat on for 30 to 40 minutes. I adjusted the time based on um, the pigments in the paint layer that I was treating. They seemed to respond differently. Um, and then these little chambers, 30 to 40 minutes, and it was using a very, very slow evaporating solvent that would, it actually would reform the surface of the paint layer. 
and it was amazing. It restored. I mean, I was I was really really concerned. If I wasn't able to treat this, it would have meant retouching an extensive amount of the painting, which would feel very uncomfortable, and frankly, wouldn't would never have given. Um, I'd never be able to do justice to the paint surface in the way that this reforming did. It was incredibly successful. It brought back a lot of the modeling to the forms. Um, we can also look at the reforming on um, slide number five. And this shows you some of the patchy areas on um, Christ's stomach. The one on the left, you can see the blanching. And what was really interesting in this area is that um, on the right side of the stomach, those areas are not blanched. And I was able, that was the first area that I tested, so um, the blanching adjacent to that, because there we could see some intact paint surface that wasn't blanched, and we could see the characteristic, this, that sort of smooth quality to the, to the paint, the type of tonality that um, we were hoping to achieve, and that was, you know, it was a really good reference to work from as a sample. And then after that worked so well, I, you know, sort of moved across, across the, the painting systematically and um, everything seemed to reform, so it was nice. And in the end, there were some losses of paint, and I retouched those, but it was a small amount, and it was amazing. I think the most amazing part of this treatment was to see what the painting can give back on its own, and it really, it came back together on its own, so it was really So, nice. Nika, those, those broad areas of retouching that were so evident mm -hmm. uh, the fly that you showed uh, of the ultraviolet uh, image that picked up all the retouching. Uh, a great many of those were completely unnecessary once the solvent reformation had been done. Ab absolutely. I think those, um, the old retouching was applied merely just to broad passages applied over the worst areas of the blanching to sort of tone it back. Um, and yeah, the, once that was uncovered, those none of those areas required retouching. And the only areas that required were areas where there were actual physical loss. Of paintings or really widely open cracks. One thing that is not evident in these slides that is very evident when one stands in front of the painting is that that pasty look um, it was very opaque and it was not allowing the, the very typical technique of Bronzino and his shop that's very luminous because the paint layers are not all that thick uh, that allow light to come and bounce off uh, the ground surface and back. That luminosity um, of form you've restored to the painting, and that's one of the most remarkable uh, achievements of your restoration. I think that people, certainly people here in Portland, who know the painting well, when they see it back on the wall, they're going to be uh, very pleasantly uh, surprised. I think we, maybe it would be good to put up the before treat slide number 11 to see the before and after. You know, and Dawson had mentioned that sort of the flatness of the forms. I also think that sculptural quality was really, I mean, becomes evident after treatment. Well, the thing that's jumping out, of course, uh, <laughs> first and foremost, is the immense change in tonality uh, of uh, removing that discolored varnish. Nika, could you tell us a little bit about what you found about the structure of, of the painting? Sure. I just mentioned uh, uh, the ground uh, layer and the like, and, and you found some very interesting things about how the painting was created. Yeah, so the painting itself, um, can we put a picture up of the reverse of the painting? Um, so the painting is, it's painted on a wood panel of poplar wood, and it comprises three pieces of, of wood. Um, it's interesting, there are, there are two larger um, planks of wood and then one very tiny plank of wood along, strip along the right edge of the painting. Um, but then these pieces were joined together with glue. And then you can see these, there are three bars that go across the reverse. Those are not original, but those are, those are cross members. Those are later additions to the panel. Um, we're un unclear whether there ever were um, crossbars that are sort of integral to the piece when the panel was formed. Um, we know that and traditionally there never were three cross members, but there may have been two or one cross members. Um, 
And the, the members that you see here, part of the treatment, we ended up removing those members. They are made of a different type of wood, much stronger, and they were bracing the panel. I mean, the panel, these, the wood want, reacts to fluctuations in relative humidity, and it wants to move a little. And these, these cross members were really causing um, a lot of tension for the wood. So they were removed, and that helped relax the panel. But it, some parts of the panel had already cracked as a result of this tension from the cross members. So we had George Visaka, who's um, sort of a leading expert on panel restoration. He came and he worked. Um, he works at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and we were so fortunate to have him come and treat treat the panel. So he was able to work in these areas that where there were some splits of the joins, and um, keep them structurally sound. So um, I think that was really really helpful. Um, and what's oh. Nika, uh, the yes. one thing I would say that that isn't necessarily going to be uh, uh, evident to people is that this is a beautifully preserved panel, all in all. It has not been thinned. And how how deep is it? A uh, two two inches? It's one and a half inches. And one and a half inches. Oh. And really, really common. And I think a lot of people don't really realize. So it's, we're so lucky to have this untouched panel, and as Dawson mentioned, so many panels, they could be thin to you know, a quarter inch, and they sort of lose that structural integrity. Um, this, the painting is heavy when you lift it. It's a, it's, it's a monumental work of art, and it's a monumental object. We should say that, for those who don't know, that panels were often thinned in the name of conservation uh, because it was thought that thinning them would reduce the amount of play uh, with relative humidity, but in many cases, um, uh, it, it made more problems. Um, and if we go to slide number seven, um, in this we can see the X-ray that was taken of the panel, and um, so the painting is on the left, and the X-ray is on the right. And an X-ray can tell us a lot about the structure. Um, so what? stands out most quickly is um, on the right you can see the thin strip that is one of the, the planks of the panel and this sort of white you could see they look like white nails they're radio opaque which is why we see the metal of the nails um, those nails are we don't believe that they're original but um, a restorer has added those to sort of reinforce the join there is a crack in um, along the join so I think those were added for security, probably at the time of that the cross members were added. Um, and then what's interesting about the x-ray is it also gives us a lot of information about the artist's technique and um, paint application. Um, and we'll go back to this when we talk about the paint, but I just sort of wanted to also discuss the preparation of the panel. So once the panel was fabricated, um, then it was um, a preparatory layer was put on. So a gesso layer, a calcium sulfate layer, was applied to the panel. And interestingly enough, um, examination of the painting under the stereo microscope showed that this gesso layer was sanded smooth, um, which isn't all traditionally done in these types of paintings. Um, I think it, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about trying to create that smoothness of bronzino and maybe working on this lower level just to create, you know, to get it at this paint as smooth as possible. Um, and then we examine the painting with infrared reflectography, and it's a t technique that can often um, detect underdrawings, and an underdrawing was not detected. And questions became, how did the artist, we know that Bronzino's painting exists, how did the artist transfer that image to his prepared panel? Um, and typically that was, would often be done either with incision work or um, with a draw, an underdrawing that was made. And um, we didn't find any evidence of either of those transfer techniques. So it doesn't mean that they're not there. Um, what happened is that the next layer was made, a brown layer was put on top of this white um, gesso layer. And interestingly, it's dark. It was a brown um, layer, but it was made of red and black pigment particles. And that was applied overall. Infrared examination did show us the method of application. And interestingly, it was applied very hastily, haphazardly, and unevenly. So it didn't seem to um, serve as a drawing, or we didn't see any evidence of it marking out contours or any modeling of the forms. 
But um, after the reforming treatment, we were really able to get a better um, look at the paint surface and to study it under the stereo microscope. All the blanching and the murky varnish, we really weren't able to see the surface that well. And um, if we go to slide number nine, um, what I did find is that on top of the brown layer that was applied overall, a sketch was made. You could see what you're seeing over there, these sort of light lines that are sketched lines. They were made in paint. So the artist then sort of just quickly sketched out the contours of the forms on top. It sort of makes sense. The panel itself was already dark with this brown layer. So even if there was a, a drawing underneath, it was probably difficult to see. And so he used a light, a light paint on top to sketch in order to see his form, um, in order to you know, use that as a guide for building up with paint layers. Um, and so I, know, I only noticed those I could look with that what you're seeing there is a photograph taken under the stereo microscope. And so we're looking at high magnification. And Where are we, Nika? Where are we on the painting? We are on the Christ child's heel. So we're looking around at the contour of his foot. And um, yeah, it was really, and I, I could see that all along areas. And then when, what was really interesting is when you look at the um, x-ray, we don't see anything, any artist changes or things called pentimenti, where the artist was very direct when he painted this image and when he, he worked up from an image, whether it, he, it seems, there are, it's as if he left the figures, he painted the figures, he left areas in, in reserve, and there are gaps around the edges of the figure. Background paint doesn't necessarily go extend exactly to the edges of the contours. And I think that that's because he left this light skate, um, sketched um, underpaint. I think he left that underpainted image, he left it visible till very late stages of painting. And then he brought paint up, up to those edges. Um, and that's why it's visible under the stereo microscope. Um, so he was really following, following the image, following the underpainted areas. Um, yeah, no, it's not, but it's not the level of underdrawing that you would uh, would expect with Bronzino himself. Yeah, absolutely. And it's surprising if you think about someone copying an image, it's surprising that an underdrawing isn't more worked up. You would expect all these areas to be demarcated and some sort of following a guideline. Um, but it's possible that there was some sort of underdrawing that we're not able to, de to detect that was there. Um, and another really interesting aspect of the, of the painting is if we want to talk about the blue rope, um, that would be slide number 10. Um, so we're looking at the Madonna's, at the blue, looking at her lap. And um, well, we don't have an image of the, the Bronzino painting, but the Bronzino painting, um, the Madonna's lap, it, it's bright, brilliant blue, um, possibly painted in um, the pavement ultramarine which is made as lapis lazuli. And um, in this painting, her, you can see it's sort of a faded, a pale blue. And the question was, it, thinking, is this a discoloration? Did this painting always look this way? Was it born this way? And I think it's a, it's a combination. Um, if the, what you're looking on the right, so I took a tiny microscopic sample about the size of a pinhead and we made a cross section. And so what you see on the right is a cross section and it allows us to see the paint layering structure. So what we're seeing, that very large, thicker bottom most light layer, that's the gesso. On top of that, we see a really thin layer, which is the brown layer that I talk, talked about, that under layer. And then we're looking at the blue layer on top. And um, I was able to do analysis, scientific analysis of these pigments. And we detected um, the elements of cobalt, and which suggests, highly suggests, that the blue that we're seeing is a pigment smalt. And it was a substitute, of a less expensive pigment that was used um, by artists that have the same visual brightness and characteristics of the more expensive and precious lapis lazuli in the ultramarine. Um, and unfortunately, although it had that same, at the time, that same brilliance and brightness of blue, um, this pigment called smalt, it um, unfortunately discolors um, for various reasons, um, and it can turn a grayish cast, or often a brownish. And um, so, what we're seeing in the blue of the Madonna's robe, we're seeing a discoloration that has occurred. 
Um, but if you look in the cross section, you can see that that layer comprises blue pigments along with a lot of white pigments to suggest that this was never meant to be a dark blue. It always had some sort of, you know, a muted muted palette to it. Um, I don't know whether it was necessary a pastel type tonality, but it was a lighter blue. And I also think that that dark brown underlayer, it must have imparted some visual quality to this small blue layer. So I think it probably always had a slight, slightly muted cast to it, but not to the degree that we're seeing here. We are seeing some discoloration. It may have been much more brighter blue. Nika, um, tell people who don't know what smalt was made of. So smalt is, it's made of cobalt containing glass. I mean, it's a pigment that's made of glass. And of course, that's one of the reasons. It's this, like a dye. It, uh, it, it, with exposure to light, can fade and change. Yeah, and it has certain components. It's, um, it has basically, it's a leaching of these alkaline components. It has potassium in it, and um, how it also how that pigment reacts to the medium of the paint. Can the, the medium discolors over time? So it's a, it's an unfortunate. Um, alteration and there's nothing that we can do about this dis discoloration and there's and, and we should say that it is very very common yes uh, very common this period and you know it, it makes us think though because even though there's this discoloration um, it is interesting to think that this artist chose this particular palette of these lighter colors we have a light pink for the Madonna's robe and it would have been a lighter blue for um, for her mantle, um, you know, and maybe that's something to Dawson. If you want to talk about possibilities of attribution, um, yes. Well, I think one of the, the amazing things that's come out of this is the great change uh, in, in tonality, and it's we're now able to see that these colors are not as richly saturated as we would normally associate with Bronzino's works, and to me, the palette suggests that this is a bit later, maybe not later than Bronzino's life, uh, but but maybe up into the 60s, even 70s. Bronzino dies in 1572. Um, but to me, it suggests that it is a palette more typical of the end of the 16th century uh, than the mid-16th century. Uh, but I'm being very subjective with that. There, it has been suggested that um, the painting may be uh, an early work uh, by Santi di Tito, um, who worked with Bronzino and perhaps trained with Bronzino. We're, we're not exactly sure. Um, and that's been suggested or, uh, as, a, as a thought by Robert Simon, um, who I hope doesn't mind me uh, mentioning this on air. Um, and it's an interesting thought and one that, that uh, in terms of color at least, fits pretty well. Nika, what else could we uh, we tell them? One thing that it has occurred to me is that we should say that you have not finished uh, your restoration uh, of the painting, uh, that there is one very important step uh, uh, left in, in that. Yes, um, so the painting still is awaiting its final varnish, um, which I'm very excited. It's sort of the final phase and uh, will give us Really, I think it's going to improve the saturation of the painting. I and mean, we're looking at a painting with minimal varnish at the present. Um, it's going to provide a surface gloss. And I think it will help restore the, the balance um, of surface texture. Um, interestingly, the Christ child figure is very smoothly painted. But the St. John figure, it has a much more, um, there's br rapid brush strokes. And it's much more textural. Um, and then the, the background, so the background is made of a copper resonate pigment, the green, and we can hardly see into the depths of the shadows of the folds of the drapery, and I think we're going to get much more of that will be restored when the varnish is put back on, saturating and creating, um, you know, these right now, we're going to get much more depth with these figures in the background. We should say for, for, for those who who don't know uh, that it is, of course, one of the purposes of varnish is protection, but another is to tr to saturate, to uh, to bring out the colors and and the forms. 
Um, and you, you said something else, uh, too, and that is that there is a bit of varnish, of course, on the painting now. Um, yes. And one of the basic principles of, of, of restoration, and I should let you take over <laughs> and explain why there is a layer covering yes. the original paint. So um, after the, um, I put varnish on for the reforming treatment, but even if we didn't do a reforming treatment before any, before I do any restoration on the painting, I would always put a varnish. It's not only is it a protect, protective layer for the painting, but it also separates any restoration that I would put on from the original paint paint layer and renders it. It could be removed over time. Um, something I thought I don't know. Maybe people would be interested, in sort of, to thinking about what we do when we do. You will hear the words retouching or in painting, um, and what that means is there would be areas of loss, and um, I would recreate those areas of loss using pigments. Um, I don't know if you can see. I bought some pigments. People can see, <laughs> and um, we mix pigments with um, a resin that we know is readily soluble and can be removed, and it could be removed in solvents um, that are fairly mild and would not disturb the original paint layer. So if, um, and what's nice is the resins and the varnishes that we use um, on the Crest Collection, not only have they been age test scientifically, but the beauty of the Crest Collection is that we've been treating it the same way for over 50 years, and so one of the earliest paintings that it's in the National Gallery in Washington, D.C., these materials were used on it, and it looks absolutely beautiful. And we know that at least for 50 plus years, that our restorations are going to stand the test of time. So I think having real, you know, looking at a real painting as an example um, gives us much more confidence in the materials that we're using. And just to, to emphasize that in the course of the 20th century, um, the concept of reversibility which is first and foremost in conservation today, uh, came into being. It used to be that if retouching were needed, it was done right on the surface, often with oil colors that would cross-link with the original paint and, and create problems of their own. Um, but that now, the next time, hopefully it's going to be more than 100 years, uh, that the painting needs to be cleaned, um, all of the work that you've done is at least in terms of retouching, is going to come right up. This has been one of the things that in the course of my career I've always admired about my conservator colleagues is spending hundreds sometimes of hours uh, retouching a painting knowing full well that eventually it's all going to be wiped out. <laughs> and but of course this is the brilliance of modern conservation that your work can be removed without damaging the original. Exactly, exactly. Um, and also something I just wanted to say that's a little different from when, I don't know if you recall in the image with ultraviolet light, that that retouching was very broadly applied and brushed across the surface. And in this restoration, if retouching was put on dot, point by point, dot by dot, um, only in areas of loss. Um, and the knee of the Christ child, there was a very large loss. So that area, that was um, was retouched. Um, but otherwise, the beauty of this treatment was how little I physically had to do to the painting. The painting, it was revived, it brought itself back, and had that reforming treatment not have happened, it would have required an extensive amount of retouching on top of original paint, um, just to, to sort of touch out those areas that were that were so light and chalky, and so um, this was really it was it was an honor to treat this painting, and just such a pleasure. Well, and Nika, huge congratulations to you on um, this tweaking of John Brealey's uh, recipe for blanching. Really did do the trick, and uh, the painting looks marvelous. I see we're coming up uh, uh, now on 40 minutes in, and I'm wondering if Mike. Um, has questions that we might be addressing from our, our viewers. We, yeah, we had some questions come in. Um, and you guys have done such a great job covering a lot of it. Um, they related to, um, you know, talking more about how is this a school, you know, circle of Bronzino versus a Bronzino. And you've talked, um, I think, great about that. Um, so I think um, some people, I think, were chiming in mid-hangout. So kind of going back and viewing this um, might help answer some of those questions. Um, and then one about kind of the history of 
previous restorations. The question was, you know, um, was there only one restoration campaign in this painting's history, or have there been multiple treatments? And so you addressed that. Um, I didn't know if you wanted to add anything um, to that about that question, or if we've kind of covered that. Of course, it's one of the hardest questions uh, for uh, any conservator to answer, but I'll turn it over to, to Nika. Would you, <laughs> would you venture a guess? I would guess uh, several. Uh, yeah, definitely right. several. There there have been several that have been documented. Fortunately, there is some documentation, but um, often, I, this Dawson mentioned that this painting came from Contini Bodenkasi collection, and many of the crest paintings were bought from Count Conati, um, Contini. And often we find that they already by that time many of the paintings have already undergone many restoration campaigns. So it's a long history of restorations. Yeah, so it's we're lucky that we do have some of the documentation. But that we only have records beginning in 1950. Yes. Which of course is very late. There's no provenance going back beyond uh, Contini Bonacosi. Uh, though, um, uh, who knows? Maybe in time we'll uh, we'll discover things about it, it its history. But uh, at the moment, uh, the provenance is very brief. I think one uh, one thing that might just be interesting briefly, Nika, you've talked a little bit about uh, your process and showed us the pigments. But um, tell us a little bit about where you're connecting to us from, because we've been talking a lot about this amazing painting that's like inches behind you. But um, it'd be great yeah. to hear maybe a little tiny bit about where you are and and your role there a little bit. Um, great, wonderful. So I am at the Conservation Center, which is part of the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University. And we are a graduate training program for conservation. Um, and we take students that learn, it's not just paintings conservation, objects conservation, paper, books, um, and textiles. And so what's a fabulous part of our program is the Crest Conservation Program. And this students get to work on old master paintings from the Crest Collection. Um, it's an extraordinary program, an amazing opportunity. Um, and the senior restorer, Diane Modestini, um, the, she, she work, I work with her. And um, we teach a course where students learn the cleaning and retouching of paintings. Um, and then students learn all the examination techniques and studying um, and scientific analysis of paintings and how to apply that to a treatment. We could maybe say that um, Diane is a, a an amazing resource uh, regarding the uh, the Crest Collection. Uh, she knows it very very well, and her late husband Mario was uh, Samuel Crest's restorer uh, for decades. Yeah, and I think um, I do want to say when I was talking about the how we work and the materials that we use. Um, that early restoration that I mentioned was a restoration that was done by Mario Modestini. Um, it's amazing that the, the system that Mario had come up with and that we've been we're using that same, that same system all along. Um, and I was very fortunate enough to meet Mario Modestini and to learn so much about him and, and really to learn everything through Diane. So it's, it's been extraordinary. Fantastic. Thanks. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing that, um, those rich points. I think um, we're going to wrap up here because our time is just about done. And um, one thing I wanted to add is a little bit about, so when this painting's on its way back, not too far from now, here to Portland. Um, and one of the things that's been really great to work with, um, being in education here at the Portland Art Museum, working with Dawson on projects, um, to really be thinking about how we're going to engage the public. How are we going to... Um, you know, turn all this conservation work that you beautifully talked about and really uh, share that with our visitors and be transparent about some of these processes with the painting. Um, Dawson and I both agree, as I'm sure you do, Nika, that um, the public loves to learn about these behind the scenes aspects of museums and what goes into the processes that gets these paintings on the wall and protects them and preserves them and restores them. Um, so we're um, part of the Crest Foundation support for this project, which pretty much touches every aspect of this entire painting and this process. Um, we'll continue this fall when Philippa Pitts, who is our Crest Interpretive Fellow that we have coming up um, this upcoming year, um, is going to be joining us. And she'll be working with our interpretive media specialists, Kristen Bayans and Dawson, and a whole team of people to think about how we can create um, online as well as in-gallery resources that will share some of this process and really allow people to take 
a new look at this painting. But we're so excited to have it come back. And um, thank you both. I can't thank you enough for being able to share this process and this thinking um, about this incredible painting um, today with the online audience and with people that will view it. Um, so thank you, Nika, and thank you, Dawson. Thank you, Mike. And and especially thank you, Nika, uh, and huge congratulations. It's a, a restoration triumph. Thank you, but it really, it's the, it's the painting that did it. it. This was an honor for me to treat this painting, and I'm really, one other aspect that I just didn't mention, I just wanted to say how exciting it is for this painting to get back in its original frame. It has a beautiful frame, and I think to see it on the wall is going to be spectacular. So looking forward to for its return. I'll be sad for it to leave, but <laughs> more importantly, for it to get back in your galleries. We'll be happy to have it back, definitely. But um, again, thank you both. And just to wrap up, uh, a couple quick points. So the painting will be returning if you're watching this video from Portland or if you're watching the archive and you're here in Portland or in the region. Um, stay tuned to you know the website, um, PDX Art Museum on Twitter. Um, and portlandartmuseum.org will definitely have announcements about when the painting comes back on view, and we'd love to have people come in and see it. Um, no doubt we'll get Dawson out there, too, to have some conversations about this, um, and we'll keep referring back to this program. If you're watching this um, in archive and you do have any questions, always feel free to hashtag them on Twitter, Portland Art Museum, and we can definitely get back. We're happy to share any of these questions with Dawson and Nika um, and get back to anybody that has questions. But um, from the Portland Art Museum, I'm Mike Morawski, and uh, thank you, everyone, for watching. And we will uh, see you uh, hopefully here at the museum. If not, we'll see you online.